Welcome back. One of the ethical theories that we've studied is, of course, utilitarianism. And you've spent a fair bit of time uh, reading Bentham and Mill and listening to video lectures about their uh, versions of utilitarianism. What I would like to do in this uh, set of video lectures is go over some well-known objections to utilitarianism. And just as with the objections to Aristotle, what I'll try to do is uh, say a little bit about what the objections are, of course. I'll say what the criticism is. And then I'll say a little bit about how utilitarians um, can respond to those criticisms. And the, the point, again, uh, is not to convince you of any particular position. It's not to convince you that utilitarianism is wrong for these reasons or that it is ultimately right because it can respond to the objections effectively. The point is to introduce you to a little bit of the critical conversation that has gone on about utilitarianism. Uh, in contemporary ethical theory, there are some philosophers, Peter Singer, for instance, who I um, discuss in another set of video lectures for this week, uh, who who defend utilitarianism and who basically um, you know, think that it's, that it's correct and it's the right ethical theory. And there are others who disagree with utilitarianism. So these, um, this, is, this is basically an introduction to a debate, not a um, teaching you what you should think, okay? Um, and uh, I will, um, I, I would like you at the same time, though, to try to follow these arguments and have some sense of what are the things that people say for and against utilitarianism. So the first of these objections I'll consider is the objection that pleasure isn't the only good. Remember that the principle of utility, both in Bentham and in Mill's formulation, ultimately just means that we ought to act in such a way as to maximize pleasure and minimize pain for those affected by our actions. And uh, both, um, sorry, uh, both of the examples of the the swine-like objection, which I discussed uh, in the videos on Mill, and the example of the happiness machine, uh, or the pleasure machine, I think I called it. Um, those were both examples that were intended to uh, argue that there's something wrong with this part of utilitarianism. Uh, it seems like, it seems like pleasure isn't the only thing that we think is, is good. Uh, and so any ethical theory that says that you should just maximize pleasure and minimize pain, it seems to be too simplistic of a theory about what are the things that we want to achieve and the things that we consider to be ethically good. So it's a very broad kind of objection. It's, it's kind of attacking utilitarianism really at, at the root in a way since their very uh, principle of ethics is founded on this claim that the difference between good and bad is just the difference between um, how much pleasure or pain are generated by actions. Um, but there, there are some possible replies that the utilitarians can make to these objections, um, which I will uh, share with you now. So one possible reply um, comes from Bentham. I haven't listed it on the slide. Bentham's response is basically, look, uh, whatever thing it is that you think is more valuable than pleasure or pain is probably just something that causes you individually pleasure and um, that or that causes you individually pain. And if you really think about it carefully, you have no more right to say that those things are valuable than somebody else does to say that the things that cause them pleasure are valuable. So ultimately, the the um, the standard should still just be pleasure and pain. So it's a kind of a, a simple style of argument. It's included actually in the six pages from Bentham that we read. He makes an argument of that kind. Um, but the, the basic idea is just kind of challenging the person to make a case who says that pleasure isn't the only good, to make a case that whatever thing they think of as a good that's not um, good because it generates pleasure, if they, if they say, if they try to say in more detail, what, why they're confident that it is not just subjectively good, not just good in their own opinion or in their own experience, but is good objectively, that is, is good for everyone or is should be the thing that we um, try to achieve with our actions, that they won't be able to do it and that uh, ultimately they'll have to admit that their 
thing that they're calling a good other than pleasure is just a kind of peculiar personal fancy, a, a, a personal taste issue, rather than something um, that should guide moral action and, and guide us in determining what are the good consequences for everyone. Another possible reply to this objection is Mill's reply. So Mill, um, as you read and as you uh, as we went over in the video lectures, says that there's a difference between lower quality and higher quality pleasures. And so the things that the objector is thinking of when they say um, utilitarian only recognizes pleasure, so they don't recognize, for instance, creativity, they don't recognize um, the pursuit of truth, they don't recognize they don't recognize uh, moral uh, action in the service of other people's well-being. They don't recognize, um, uh, you know, I, I, virtues, you know, personal um, characteristics like courage and so on as goods. Well, Mill replies by saying, look, utilitarianism can recognize all those things as goods and it just it just recognizes them as higher quality pleasures rather than lower quality ones okay so they might those things like courage or the pursuit of truth or creativity they're all they may not generate as much as much pleasure quantitatively as um just say uh eating eating um, tasty food, okay? But they generate more pleasure qualitatively because people who have an experience of the pleasure associated with pursuing the truth or fighting for justice or um, or uh, being or, or participating in some creative activity like art or music, that even though those things may be quantitatively less pleasurable than uh, eating tasty food, they are qualitatively more pleasurable. And we know that because people who have an experience of both things actually prefer those qualitatively higher pleasures. And this is what led Mill to his famous line that it's better to be a human being satisfied, I'm sorry, it's better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, uh, which was part of his argument for this claim that people will prefer the higher quality pleasures over the lower quality ones, and um, utilitarianism should recognize that. And the pleasure machine makes essentially the same point, because the pleasure machine uh, case is one where we have this imaginary machine where if anybody gets in the machine, the machine will keep them alive just by feeding them through tubes and so on, and it will generate more pleasure than they can experience out in the world outside of the pleasure, and it will do it indefinitely, okay, and without a major pain cost associated with it. They just, it will just experience more pleasure overall in the machine than out of the machine. And so this leads us to ask then the, the puzzling question, would we ourselves want to be in this machine for the rest of our lives? Would we want to encourage others to get into this machine uh, for as much time as possible? It seems like the principle of utility, at least as Bentham has defined it and, and applied it, um, that the principle of utility would lead us to say, yes, we all ought to get in these machines and we ought to encourage as many people as we can to get in these machines. Our, our, our best utilitarian policy would be to get as many human into these, humans into these machines for as long as possible. Um, and that seems weird because a lot of us, when we hear about this case, we think, no, I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life in a pleasure machine. And no, I don't think it would be good if all of humanity got into pleasure machines, right? So this is essentially making the same objection as the swine-like objection, okay? It's just another way of making the same argument, basically. And uh, the reply from Mill is basically the same. Mill will say, yes, I agree with you that we shouldn't encourage everyone to get into the pleasure machine. But the reason for that is that the pleasure machine is only going to be able to generate lower quality pleasures. Higher quality pleasures, like the pleasures of actually being a creative person, you know, actually um, engaging in creativity and actually um, uh, pursuing truth and so on, those things are only possible outside of the machine, okay? And so that's why we prefer to be outside of the machine because the things that we can experience outside the machine, the pleasures we can experience outside the machine, we recognize as of higher quality than those that we can experience inside the machine. Um, 
Now, I should also say, because we're familiar now with virtual reality and the Matrix movies and things like that, um, if it were the case that this pleasure machine allowed was a kind of VR setup, and if it allowed for people to communicate with other people who are also in the, in machines, then it might be possible to have something kind of like a, you know, Minecraft type world or like a second life type world where people could actually be creative to some extent inside the VR world. And they could, to some extent, probably pursue truth and learn things within the VR world. So some of the, um, some of what makes the pleasure machine less good overall than the real world would actually be some of that difference would be um, lessened to the extent to which the pleasure, the the elements of the pleasure machine that do more than just generate pleasure, for instance, those that allow people to communicate with each other, um, those that allow people to gather information, uh, and learn about things, those that allow people to uh, to express themselves creatively, and so on. So, th to the extent to which we add those things to the internal virtual world generated by the pleasure machine, then um, that's the extent to which we lessen the gap and the difference between the um, being in the pleasure machine and being out in the world. And so Mill would have to say that, well, in those cases, there are uh, some higher quality pleasures that are accessible inside the machine. Probably still n never going to be some of the um, higher quality pleasures that are available outside the machine. Like, for instance, actually studying a tree or a forest or an animal, right? A real tree or forest or animal you can't really do inside this virtual world. And if you thought that that was a higher quality activity, higher quality pleasure, then that would lead you to say that um, you should still prefer being outside the machine to being inside it. Now, I want to briefly note at this point that uh, there is a possible reply to Mill's reply. That is, and the objection the objector could continue and could continue to try to make their case even after Mill's reply by saying something like this. They might say, well, wait a minute, Mill. Why do you describe these things you call higher quality pleasures as pleasures? Is it, is it, are they really pleasures? Is that really what we value about them? For instance, being creative, expressing oneself creatively or pursuing truth. Is pursuing truth valuable because it's pleasurable or is pursuing truth something that we think is valuable like intrinsically or it's valuable because of the kind of thing that it is not because it generates any kind of pleasure okay and if it's the if it's the latter if it i'm sorry if it if it's if it's good be, if we think it's good because of the kind of thing that it is rather than it generating pleasure then it seems like mill is just saving utilitarianism by using the word pleasure in a really weird way. He's expanding the meaning of the word pleasure to include all kinds of things that it really doesn't naturally apply to. Um, an Aristotelian, for instance, uh, you know, people who follow Aristotle's views, um, would recognize lots of goods besides pleasure. Remember, that was something that Aristotle himself emphasized in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. And so, uh, if if that's if that's the way that you're thinking, if, if one is thinking like an Aristotelian, then one's going to recognize the various character attributes, the virtues as goods, um, and as things that you can't access inside a pleasure machine. Um, another another way to make that point is for Aristotle, the chief good is happiness, which in Greek is eudaimonia, which also means flourishing, and he describes it as a kind of activity right? So it's a kind of pattern of life. Um, it, it, it doesn't make sense from an Aristotelian perspective to think that somebody could be happy inside a pleasure machine because the pleasure machine, in the pleasure machine, they're not being active. They're just receiving all of this, um, you know, uh, sensory stimulation, but they're not actually doing anything. They're, the pattern of their life is not that of a happy human, and so they can't, they can't be happy. Um, and uh, so what you see here is a, is a kind of standoff between an Aristotelian picture and a utilitarian picture. And part of what Mill was trying to do actually with this, with even considering this objection and the way that he replied to it, he's trying to 
integrate or bring on board some Aristotelian elements into utilitarianism because he thinks that um, it is important to recognize in your moral theory that there's something good about things like creative expression and um, community connections with other people and um, uh, the pursuit of truth and so on that aren't obviously interpretable as just a matter of seeking pleasure. So his reply about the difference between higher quality and lower quality pleasures is intended to be a way to make a recognition of those other goods which an Aristotelian picture already recognizes. He's trying to make it possible to recognize those that wider range of goods within a utilitarian ethical framework.